ways. And we get to learn about some of those things tonight. And I pray, Lord, that you would um, teach us and that you would help us worship you, that this would be more than just an intellectual study of architectural plans, but, Lord, that we would truly worship you and see your glory in this and be amazed that you invite us to come and uh, be with you. So, Lord, we thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, some churches, and including us, Calvary Chapel, we, we like to say, come as you are. And I think with good reason, because, you know, there's, we've all been there. There's been places that, unless it seems you can afford to dress yourself a certain way and wear certain sort of clothes, you're not really welcome through the door. You know, unless you're coming in and your life is perfect, then don't bother coming up the stairway, that sort of thing. Those attitudes are elitist, they're legalistic. We don't need to have that at all. The Lord Jesus obviously walked among the poor and the rich alike. He offered the gospel of salvation to anybody who would repent and believe. You know, they were to come as they were. They weren't to stay as they were, but they were to come as they were because their lives were radically changed by Jesus. Now, all that being said, the idea of come as you are can possibly go a little bit too far. And if you want proof, just take a late night trip to Walmart and look around. You can see it in action, right? There's casual and then there's casual. You know, we're invited to come as we are, but at a certain point, we still need to be wearing clothes. There's at least a little decorum in every circumstance. Now, regarding our salvation and the worship of God, it's not a matter of the way we dress, but it is a matter of the way we think. It's a matter of our hearts and our attitudes. Never do we go to God on our terms, demanding that our Creator bend His will to our own compromise his own holiness to fit us perish the thought no we always go to god on his terms and we're grateful that we're invited to go to him at all the glorious thing of course is that we are invited god wants us to be with him god wants us to dwell with him and he gives us a very specific way of doing so it's through the lord jesus christ as we well know from john 14 verse 6 jesus said to him I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He is the way, the road, the path to God. He is the truth revealed by God. He is the life given by God, and the one who gives life to us is Jesus alone. To attempt to dwell with God, come to God in any other way apart from Jesus, that's an attempt in futility. God has to be the one to come and to dwell among us, inviting us to dwell with him, the way he does it is through Jesus. And you say, what does any of this have to do with Exodus 25, 26 and following? Well, it has everything to do with it. Almost the entire remainder of the book of Exodus, all the way really through chapter 40, describes both the instructions for and the construction of the tabernacle of God. And that's what we're going to find is that the tabernacle literally means a dwelling place. And in this case, this dwelling place is a portable tent that's taken with the children of Israel everywhere they went as they wandered through the wilderness until they inherited the promised land. And even after they got in and they conquered the Canaanites and the Amorites and all the rest, the Israelites were supposed to worship God at this tabernacle all the way until the temple was built by Solomon. Not that the Hebrews were always faithful in that, of course, but that was the intent. But the tabernacle was where God came to and where God dwelt among his people. Now, the heavens can't contain God, but God allowed his special presence to be with the Hebrews in this earthly tent, the tabernacle. The point, the Hebrews couldn't go to God anywhere else. They couldn't go to God in any other way. God graciously chose to dwell among them. And if they wanted to worship him, then they had to go to him on his terms and his way, and his way was the tabernacle. This is where the holiness of God was graphically showcased to the people. And when they approached this place, they knew that they were approaching the holy covenant-keeping Lord God, their king, and they were to worship and to fear him rightly. Of course, so are we through the Lord Jesus. Now, before we get into the details, there are a couple of things that we need to know up front. And first, I think it's healthy for us, and it's of interest for us to know that this structure, of course, was unique But it was not unfamiliar to the Hebrews. The idea of a war tent for a sovereign king, that was not unknown in the ancient Near East. In fact, there is a uh, a lot of hieroglyphics that point to the uh, King Ramesses II, Pharaoh Ramesses II, and he used this tent to fight the 
Hittites and the Battle of Kadesh, and if you put the dimensions together from his war tent and the tabernacle, the diagrams are actually very, very interesting, match up almost exactly parallel. Now, Ramesses likely came along later than Moses. Scholars debate that. You can talk about that some other time. But the point is, the concept is certainly there. Now, we've got to remember that the Hebrews had just come out of 400 years of Egyptian slavery, so that the idea that God chose a variation of an Egyptian form as his own tent, that actually makes a lot of sense. Because this is something that would have been understood by the Hebrews. God chose something extremely familiar in order to do something totally unique and extraordinary among them. Isn't that not unlike how God came to us in a familiar human form in order to do something truly extraordinary and unique? The second thing we need to know up front is that the tabernacle is not simply a tent of worship. It's not only a sanctuary. It's very clearly a picture of heavenly things pointing to us to a heavenly purpose. Writing of our high priest, the Lord Jesus, the author of Hebrews says this in Hebrews 8, 4 through 5, for if he, Jesus, were on earth, he would not be a priest, since there are priests who offer the gifts according to the law, who serve the copy and shadow of of the heavenly things, as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle, for he, God, said, see that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. The key point, the earthly tabernacle was a copy. It was a shadow of heavenly things. The things on earth were intended to point to things in heaven. The most important thing of heaven at this time, of course, the Son of God, the pre-incarnate Lord Jesus. So these things are, in many ways, going to point to Jesus. This being said, we need to be very careful not to take this too far. Some people look at the tabernacle and their furnishings, and they come up with all kinds of fanciful interpretations. For instance, some have argued that the uh, idea of the construction, excuse me, the, the, the scriptures are about the instruction, then the construction of the tabernacle. Well, that's parallel with creation week. Uh, the, you've got light being... Uh, mandated by God, then the stars appearing later on. And, and so you've got this parallel setup. I, I think that's unlikely. Others have suggested that tiny details like the bells on the priestly robe speak of the Holy Spirit who set the gospel bells of testimony ringing. And with all due respect to otherwise very good scholars, I think Christians, we need to be very careful not to abandon basic fundamentals of biblical interpretation. We don't need to try to see symbols just to make symbols be there. We just need to let the biblical text speak for itself. But what we find is that it does speak of Jesus. There is far too much symbolism shown in the tabernacle, later picked up in the New Testament, not to see Jesus in it. The tabernacle is all about the dwelling place of God. And who is Christ other than God come to dwell among us? So, of course, the tent will point to Christ. It couldn't do otherwise. All right, so how did all this come about? Well, we need to remember that once the children of Israel got to Mount Sinai, God, remember, personally showed His glory to them, spoke the Ten Commandments in their hearing. They are so overwhelmed by God's majestic power, they feared. But that proper fear of God actually helped them commit themselves even further to His covenant. And, of course, this was further explained uh, to Moses by God, Moses being their intermediary. But the people agreed to obey everything the Lord said to do, and Moses showed the covenant sealed with the blood of sacrifice. Moses and the elders of Israel fellowship with God with the covenant meal on the mountain. Moses, though, he alone is called up further. And when Exodus 24 left off, Moses is seen walking into the midst of the cloud of glory on Mount Sinai, and at the top of the mountain consumed in God's holy fire. He's up there 40 days and 40 nights. What was it that Moses saw and heard during those 40 days and 40 nights? Well, simply put, he saw and heard all of chapters 25 through 31. God gave to Moses all the instructions for the tabernacle, the priestly garments, the priestly ordination, and a lot more. He showed Moses everything that the children of Israel required to build the place that God could and he would dwell among them. It is so amazing that God desires to dwell among his people. See, he approaches us in order that we can approach Him. We approach God in God's way that we might dwell with Him through Jesus. So we're going to start in chapter 25, and it really starts with a little bit of an introduction, the offerings for the tabernacle in verse 1. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, that they may bring me an offering. From everyone who gives it willingly with his heart, you shall take my offering. And this is the offering which you shall take from them, gold, silver, and bronze, Blue, purple, and scarlet thread, fine linen and goat's hair, ram skin dyed red, badger skins and acacia wood, 
oil for the light, spices for the anointing oil, and for the sweet incense, onyx stones and stones to be set in the ephod and the breastplate. Now, before any instructions are given for the tabernacle itself, instructions are first given for an offering. Now, that makes sense, because if things are going to be built, you need requires, or you need the materials to build them, right? That's first required. And God lists all kinds of things, including these precious metals, gold, silver, and bronze. And you say, well, wait a second. The Hebrews were former slaves wandering in the wilderness. Where did they get all this wealth? Well, remember, they already had it. Before they left Egypt the night of the Passover, you know, God had told the Hebrews to ask all of these items from their Egyptian neighbors. And incredibly, supernaturally, by the hand of God, providentially, they received it. Hebrews received 400 years worth of back pay in a single night, and that enabled them to have more than enough gold and other wealth to use for all of this tabernacle construction. Now, with this command, before we leave it, we do see a couple of principles regarding received offerings. Number one, offerings are to be willing and voluntary, not forced. The Israelites were to give willingly with their hearts. The opportunity is presented for them to give, but it's to be a true gift. Their offerings were offerings of worship. This isn't a forced tax. This isn't, you know, manipulated out of guilt. This is reflected in the New Testament as well. Remember, Paul instructed the church to give from a cheerful heart in 2 Corinthians 9. The Old Testament standard is no different. God loves cheerful givers. The second thing is that offerings are to be appropriate, not random. The people are invited to give, but they're not invited to give their leftovers. Specific needs were to be met, and those offerings were to reflect those things. So this giving is to be done with forethought and intention. It's not haphazard and random. So likewise, our normal or regular giving ought to be planned, not left to random chance we just happen to remember to throw a few bucks in there. Nor do we give God what is of no value to us. We give God what God wants as opposed to the stuff that we don't want any longer right? All right, so verse 8, and let them build me a sanctuary, make me a sanctuary, that I may dwell among them according to all that I show you, that is the pattern of the tabernacle, and the pattern of all of its furnishings, so you shall make it. Now, of all things to remember about the tabernacle, right here, this is the key. The holy place is God's dwelling place. It's actually, uh, the, the word used is a preposition for form of the Hebrew verb to dwell. So it is a literal dwelling place. And it's not the gold, it's not the furnishing that makes the tabernacle special. It's not the ark nor the raiders that make it special. All right? It's God. God's presence is what made everything amazing. Without God, a tent is just a tent, even if it happens to be, you know, held up by golden structures. A, a temple is just a temple. Jews learned this, by the way, when God's glory departed the temple in the days of Ezekiel. These things are just buildings, they're just structures. Likewise with church buildings. A building's just a building, whether it's got spires and stained glass or whether it's a business complex with aluminum awning outside. What makes it special is whether or not God is there. And when is God ever present in a church building? Well, it's only when the church is gathered in it. The building is not the church, the people are the church. Today, we Christians, we are the dwelling place of God. God the Holy Spirit dwells in each of us, and the presence of Jesus is among us every time we gather together. So whether it's a campground under the open sky or a beautifully built architectural wonder, it's all empty space without God. But with God, when Jesus is there, it's his dwelling place. Now again, that's just the introduction. Uh, there's lengthy description of the various furnishings that come next. Um, now, again, we're going to take large chunks of scriptures. We'll summarize the dimensions as we uh, read these things, but I do have lots of diagrams for you to follow along with. And if you have a study Bible, these things help as well. First thing we're going to talk about is the ark and the mercy seat, starting in verse 10. And they shall make an ark of acacia wood, two and a half cubits shall be its length, a cubit and a half width its width, and a cubit and a half its height. And you shall overlay it with pure gold inside, and now you shall overlay it. You shall make on it a molding of gold all around. You shall cast four rings of gold for it and put them in its four corners. Two rings shall be on one side and two rings on the other side. And you shall make poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. You shall put the poles into the rings on the sides of the ark that the ark may be carried by them. The poles shall be in the rings of the ark. They shall not be taken from it. 
and you shall put into the ark the testimony which I shall give you. Now stop there. Interestingly, the very first item described about the tabernacle is not the tabernacle, right? It's not the tent itself. It's the ark that is to be contained within it. The central importance of the ark comes clear in verse 16. Moses is commanded to uh, put the future tablets of the Ten Commandments within it. Now, the ark itself, and by the way, I define a cubit. There's a standard, lots of different standards out there. I prefer the standard of 18 inches long. So if you use that, then it's three and a quarter, uh, three and three quarter feet long, two and a quarter feet wide, two and a quarter feet tall, right? And the ark itself, you got to imagine it without the mercy seat on top. It's just an open-topped box, and that's all the Hebrew word implies. It's a chest of some sort. Uh, sometimes this chest in other places, when it's not in this context, it's used for money storage or sarcophagus. Or here, something, it's a chest. It contains the sacred written law of God. Interestingly, by the way, the word that's translated ark here is different than the earlier word used for Noah's ark and the ark in which to, uh, Mo, uh, Moses was placed as a baby. Um, those are the only two times those words are used here. This is a different word entirely. Now, as to the Ark of the Testimony, uh, a lot of other fashionings as well. It's really made of acacia wood. It's overlaid with pure gold. Rings are, as we said, located on the sides of the Ark. Poles are inserted for the purpose of transport because it's so important. The Ark itself is not to be touched. We read later on, much later on in history, the hard lesson was learned by Uzzah. He placed his hand on the Ark to steady it, and he was immediately struck dead. So if you summarize the whole thing, you've got a golden box that's meant to carry, but not to be carried, at least directly. It was too holy to touch. What made it so holy? Well, God said, it's the testimony which I shall give you. It's the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are God's witness, His testimony to Israel. This is the revelation of His perfect character to His people. This is the basis of His relationship with them. These tablets, the physical tablets, were written upon by the very finger of God. And if you put it in those terms, there could hardly be any holier piece of material other than the cross of Christ itself. But the point is, you need to respect the holiness of God. It's so holy, you can't even touch it. Respect His holiness. It's so amazing it is that we are invited into a relationship with the God of the universe especially when we consider how gravely we sinned against him in the past, that he would invite us into relationship. And Jesus has called us his friends, and Jesus has made us his co-heirs. And we have this wonderfully intimate relationship with God that we can call him our Heavenly Father, and we can even use the, 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 the familial term of Abba with him. But even so, this is never something to be treated casually not to be taken for granted, not to be treated with disrespect. No matter how close we are to Jesus, we should be very, very close. At the same time, God is still God, and we're not. We need to reverence Him. We need to respect Him. All right, so that's, that's the box, right? That's the ark. What about the lid on top? Verse 17, you shall make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two and a half cubits shall be its length, and a cubit and a half its width. And you shall make two cherubim of gold of hammered work. You shall make them at the two ends of the mercy seat. Make one cherub at one end and the other cherub at the other end. You shall make the cherubim at the two ends of it and one piece with the mercy seat. And the cherubim shall stretch out their wings above, covering the mercy seat with their wings, and they shall face one another. The faces of the cherubim shall be toward the mercy seat. You shall put the mercy seat on top of the ark, and in the ark you shall put the testimony that I will give you. And there I will meet with you, and I will speak with you from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim which are on the ark of the testimony about everything which I will give you in commandment to the children of Israel. Again, the ark was without a top, so the mercy seat basically served as its lid. And so its dimensions really had to match the ark itself, right? Three and a quarter feet long, two and a quarter feet wide. Now, we get this term mercy seat in English. That was really given to us by William Tyndale, who did uh, one of the first English translations. The Hebrew word actually describes atonement. And the mercy seat plays a central part in the atonement of the sins of Israel. That's where the blood of the sacrifice was to be placed, and this it served as the throne seat of God symbolically. To Moses, remember, God said, that was where I will meet with you. So you've got a lid, practically speaking, but more than a practical lid, 
It served a spiritual purpose. And it was also highly decorated, right? You've got these two cherubim of gold, of hammered work. Creatures are facing one another, mercy seat, wings stretched out. Now, beyond that, there's really no description of the cherubim given within the, the biblical text. And you've got to wonder what they, they looked like. Imagery would have been fashioned according to the vision that Moses saw on the mountain. But scholars disagree to what the cherubim would have been. Uh, some, as you see in this particular diagram, prefer Egyptian mythology. So you've got lion-like bodies and wings and human faces. Others prefer to take the descriptions that are seen in Ezekiel 1, where you've got these cherubim with many human faces, four wings, various animal parts. In the end, Moses doesn't describe it, so we really don't know definitively. But remember what's contained inside the ark, Ten Commandments. What's the second of the Ten Commandments? Shall make no graven images. Do these statuettes of cherubim violate the second commandment? Are these not graven images? Well, we can answer that in two ways. Number one, the commandment can't be broken when God is the one making the command to make the figures. All right, he's going to be holy by default. But secondly, the purposes of these images need to be kept in mind. These cherubim are not meant to be worshipped. They picture the heavenly beings that constantly worship God. See, the second commandment is commonly misunderstood. The second commandment does not prohibit art. It prohibits idolatry. When art becomes idolatry, that's when it becomes a problem. Moses actually, you might recall, later on in their history, was commanded by God to create a, a bronze serpent that we use, use as a piece of salvation. People would look to this because of a judgment that was coming upon them. When they looked to the bronze serpent, they were healed. Jesus referenced that. Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert when people, the Son of Man is lifted up on the cross, they'll be saved. Well, that took place in Numbers 21. Well, later on in 2 Kings chapter 18, it was told to us that this serpent had become an object of idolatry. They had a name for it, Nehushtan. And so that had to be taken care of and destroyed. So the original, though, purpose was good. And if those ever became items of idolatry, then something would have been done, but it wasn't. But the whole idea is that this ark, this mercy seat combination, again, this is representative of the throne room of God. This is where God would speak with Moses. This is where God would receive the blood of the sacrifice for sin. So it's got a most holy purpose, which is why it's said in the most holy place. All right, now there's something else that's described, the table for showbread, starting in verse 23. You shall also make a table of acacia wood. Two cubits shall be its length, a cubit its width, a cubit and a half its height. She'll overlay it with pure gold and she'll make a molding of gold all around. She'll make for it a frame of a hand breadth all around. She'll make a gold molding for the frame all around. She'll make for it four rings of gold. Put the rings on the four corners so that are the four legs. The rings shall be close to the frame as holders for the poles to bear the table. And you shall make the poles of acacia wood, overlay them with gold that the table may be carried with it. You shall make its dishes, its pans, its pitchers, and its bowls for pouring. You shall make them of pure gold and you shall set the showbread on the table before me always. Now, it might seem strange to modern ears. We can understand an ark being holy, the mercy seat being holy, but how come a table? How is a table holy? Well, this is something that's designed by God for a very specific purpose. And if God can make a table holy, just think what he can do with you and me. That's pretty cool. Now, as the name suggests, this is the table that's placed in the tabernacle structure that held the loaves of bread that's often referred to as the showbread. This is three feet long, one and a half feet wide, two and a quarter feet tall. And just like the others, it's fashioned with acacia wood overlaid with pure gold. It too has rings and poles for transport, also acacia wood and pure gold. Now, all the apparatus is, of course, made out of pure gold. Now, as to its purpose, it's interesting. One scholar wrote, the table with his bread presented two sides of the same truth a Godward side and a human side. First, it stood before God, reminding Israel that they were ever open to the all-seeing eye and protection of God. Next, it was the place where the priests served and found their bread. It's a ministry unto God, and it's a ministry back unto the people. Now, we translate the term in the New King James as showbread. Other translations say the bread of presence. Uh, the idea is that this is bread constantly in the presence, in the face of God. This is always set before God, a continuing reminder of His presence among Israel and how He wanted Israel to be present among Him. 
Now, this is, of course, where we start to see the symbolism of Jesus come alive because who is Jesus? Who did he say he was? He's the bread of life, John 6, 48. What is it that we eat at the Lord's Supper, which we'll be celebrating tonight? We eat the bread symbolizing the body of Christ, Matthew 26, 26. How do we have fellowship with God? How do we stand in his presence? Only by partaking of the bread of Christ. You say, well, all that attention was paid to the table. What about this glorious golden table? It's nothing compared to the bread that sat upon it. So you've got the table. You also have the lampstand or the menorah, starting in verse 31. You shall also make a lampstand of pure gold. The lampstand shall be of hammered work. Its shaft, branches, its bowls, ornamental knobs, its flowers shall be of one piece. And six branches shall come out of its side, three branches of the lampstand on one side, and three branches of the lampstand out of the other side. Three bowls shall be made like almond blossoms on one branch with an ornamental knob and a flower. Three bowls made like almond blossoms on the other branch with an ornamental knob and a flower. And so for the six branches that come out of the lampstand. On the lampstand itself, four bowls shall be made like almond blossoms, each with its ornamental knob and flower. There shall be a knob under the first two branches of the same, knob under the second two branches of the same, knob under the third two branches of the same, extending to the six branches, according to the six branches that extend from the lampstand. Their knobs and their branches shall be of one piece. All of it shall be one hammered piece of pure gold. You shall make seven lamps for it. They shall arrange its lamps so that they give light in front of it. And its wick trimmers and their trays shall be of pure gold, shall be a talent of pure gold with all its utensils, and see to it that you make them according to the pattern which was shown to you on the mountain. Now, the term lampstand is actually the very familiar term that we know of as menorah. And we think of menorahs as being associated with Hanukkah celebrations. Um, that actually came along much later. But for this particular menorah, no precise measurements is given to its size. Text is clear that you've got seven lamps. By the way, ha uh, Hanukkah menorah has nine lamps. This has seven. Peace is described as beautiful. It's made of pure gold, hammered into resemble olive branches with a lamp on every single one of the stand. Olive, almond branches, think of an almond tree. Uh, one scholar points out, you don't know why it's described as looking like a tree. Uh, maybe it's reminiscent of the tree of life in Genesis 3. Don't really know. But in addition to the lamp's beauty, which of course it would have been very beautiful, was the cost. Remember, this is made out of a talent of pure gold. How much is a talent? It's 75 pounds worth. Now you look that up according to today's gold prices, the lamp alone is worth $1.5 million. Well over that, actually. Beautiful. Practical. Practical and beautiful. Considering that the tabernacle itself is covered with four heavy layers of various fabrics, which we'll talk about in a moment, the inside would have been very dark. So you've got light from seven candles on this menorah. That goes a long way. But beyond this practical nature is a beauty. Is there any reason and need to be pretty? No. But God cares about beauty. God cares about art. If you want proof of it, take a look outside at a clear sunset. Go driving along, see a range of mountains, look at the Milky Way. All these things are beautiful. All these things are created by God. And you know, the only reason we appreciate beauty is because God instilled it within us. How do we know that? Because we're made in the image of God. We want to be aware of thinking of God as cold and calculating and legalistic. He's righteous, yes, but he's anything but cold. Our God is a wondrous God, and he loves to create things of wonder. And when we see these things, we ought to give him praise. Now, again, don't miss the symbolism of Jesus in the menorah. Jesus himself said he's the light of the world, John 9, 5. He gives light to help us worship God. He brings us from the darkness of sin into the light of life. He puts his light within us so that we can be the light to the rest of the world, Matthew 5. So praise God that Jesus is the light, shown right there in the tabernacle. We move on to chapter 26, starting to talk about the various coverings of the structure itself, these tabernacle tent curtains. And it says, Moreover, you shall make the tabernacle with ten curtains of fine woven linen, blue, purple, and scarlet thread, with artistic designs of cherubim you shall weave them. The length of each curtain shall be 28 cubits, the width of each curtain four cubits. And every one of the curtains shall have the same measurements. Five curtains shall be coupled to one another. The other five shall be coupled to one another. It shall make the loops of blue yarn on the edge of the curtain on the selvage of one set, and likewise do on the outer edge of the outer curtain of the second set. Fifty loops you shall make in one curtain, fifty loops you shall make on the edge of the curtain that's on the end of the second set, that the loops may be clasped to one another. You shall make fifty clasps of gold and couple the curtains together with a clasp so they may be one tabernacle. So next you've got these ten curtains of the tabernacle. 
serves as its covering, its proper making of a tent here. He talked about a tent. Well, there it is. You've got to have coverings for that. Now, we're going to find four distinct layers described, starting from the innermost to the outermost, close to covering the tabernacle itself is what we just read. Finely woven linens, got blue, purple, and scarlet thread in it. Now, the purpose for these colors is left open to interpretation. You've got people all over the map there. It's not expressly stated in the map, but we do need to know that blue, purple, and scarlet, they're all royal colors. Uh, that dye was not easy to come by, only afforded by the very rich. So these are royal colors. Likewise, this fine linen that was used refers to a special type of cloth that was used by Egyptian royalty. So this first covering had royalty written all over it, right? Woven into this linen, you've got these cherubim that are designed. We talk about cherubim being on top of the ark. You've got this now on the uppermost covering of the tabernacle. Each curtain's 42 feet long, uh, four and a half feet wide. Ten curtains are made. They're five paired sets, right? Joined together by 50 golden clasps. Now, considering that this is the innermost covering, it's fitting. It's also the most artistic. And what we're going to find is that the same colors and designs that the priests see elsewhere in the tabernacle, they also see on the ceiling as they look up. And it's like he's looking into the heavens, right? And he's seeing the cherubim continually surrounding God's throne. He's entering this holy place of God. Take it from verse 7. You shall also make curtains of goats here to be a tent over the tabernacle. And you shall make 11 curtains. The length of each curtain shall be 30 cubits. The width of each curtain, 4 cubits. 11 curtains shall all have the same measurements. And you shall couple 5 curtains by themselves, 6 curtains by themselves. And you shall double over the 6th curtain at the forefront of the tent. You shall make 50 loops on the edge of the curtain that's outermost in one set, 50 loops on the edge of the curtain on the second set. You shall make 50 bronze clasps, put the clasps in the loops, couple the tent together that it may be one. The remnant that remains of the curtains of the tent, the half curtain that remains, shall hang over the back of the tabernacle. And a cubit on one side, a cubit on the other side of what remains of the length of the curtain of the tent shall hang over the sides of the tabernacle on this side and that side to cover it. So the second layer is goat's hair. Goat's hair. 11 total curtains, a little longer, a little wider than one underneath, 45 feet long, four and a half feet wide. Uh, the goat's hair was a black weather-resistant material. One commentator knows it's still used in Bedouin tent making today. As with the linen covering, the goat's hair curtains were to be joined together in paired sets, 50 loops, this time bronze class. And you've got this extra length to really cover the back of the tabernacle structure. Now, is there symbolism in the goat's hair? Well, perhaps. Goat's hair obviously would bring to mind the sacrifice, but really the main purpose was practical provides insulation for the tent. It's the first real covering, as the innermost was more decorative than anything else. And then you've got the next two summarized in verse 14. You shall also make a covering of ram skins dyed red for the tent, covering of badger skins above that. Two additional coverings here. No sizing dimension given here. Uh, the third in the series obviously speaks of sacrifice. Ram skin dyed red. What else is that going to speak of other than blood. The final uppermost covering is another leather fabric, and scholars don't really know how to identify this at all. The Hebrew describes just a kind of leather skin. Um, we don't know what kind of animal it was. Different English versions use different translations. NIV says sea cows. New King James says badgers. New American Standard says porpoise. Holman Christian says manatee skins don't really know. One commentator suggests that there are uh, such an animal called an African sea cow that's found in the Red Sea, perhaps. Um, the Jews or Israelites at this time, rather, were not seafaring people, so they would have had to gotten it from the Egyptians when they conquered the Egyptians on their way out the door. But the bottom line really is that these outermost coverings, yes, they are symbolic. We have that with the red uh, layer there, but very practical. You've got water-resistant leather, right? So that helps the ministry keep going within the tabernacle despite poor weather conditions. Let's talk about the structure itself. If you can read any of that, I know that's kind of hard to read. Starting in verse 15. As for the tabernacle, you shall make the board of acacia wood standing upright. Ten cubits shall be the length of a board, and a cubit and a half shall be the width of each board. Two tenons shall be in each board for binding one to another. Thus you shall make for all the boards of the tabernacle. And you shall make the boards for the tabernacle, 20 boards for the south side, 40 sockets of silver under the 20 boards, two sockets under each of the boards for its two tenons. 
And for the second side of the tabernacle, on the north side, there should be 20 boards, and there are 40 sockets of silver, two sockets under each of the board. For the far side of the tabernacle, westward, you shall make six boards, and you shall also make two boards for the back corners of the tabernacle. They shall be coupled together at the bottom, and they shall be coupled together at the top by one ring. Thus it shall be for both of them. They shall be for the two corners. So there will be eight boards where there are sockets of silver, 16 sockets, two sockets under each of the boards. And you shall make bars of acacia wood, five for the boards on one side of the tabernacle, five bars for the boards on the other side of the tabernacle, five bars for the boards on the side of the tabernacle for the side, far side westward. The middle bar shall pass through the midst of the boards from end to end. You shall overlay the boards with gold to make their rings of gold as holders for the bar and overlay the bars with gold. You shall raise it up the tabernacle according to the pattern which you were shown on the mountain. So the structure itself, 48 boards of acacia wood, overlaid with gold, right? Each board is 15 feet long, two and a quarter feet wide. The boards are bound together, not by nails, right? Binding together by nails is going to make it hard to take down and put up every place you go. It got these tenons, as it says in New King James, New American Standards. Or NIV says projections. Literally, the Hebrew term refers to hands. Don't exactly know how it fit together, but it seems to be a slotted sort of form, hands. Boards are cut to fit together like a jigsaw puzzle. Uh, the north and the south sides of the tabernacle, they're comprised of 20 boards each. Westward is comprised of six boards. Remaining two boards are reserved for those back two corners. Boards are not to rest directly on the ground. They don't touch the ground itself, right? They sit on 40 sockets of silver. So the whole thing, you put it together, is 45 feet in length, 15 feet in height, 13 and a half feet in width. Now, in addition to these tenons that join those hands, that join those boards together, God instructed Moses to make these bars of acacia wood overlaid with gold, provide stability to the structure. No precise measurement given, but detailed instructions as to their use. Five, of course, for each of the three size, two bars running uh, through the top and two through the rings at the bottom. The middle bar is to pass through the midst of the boards from end to end. Now, you got a mire, that's pretty practical of a design, particularly for a building that's going to be disassembled and reassembled hundreds of times over the course of hundreds of years. This is something that's meant to last. It's got a very specific size, got a very specific assembly. Even the, the, the framework is shown to Moses by God on the mountain. You, you see something going on here? God isn't leaving anything to chance, is he? See, when it comes to how we approach God in worship, when it comes to Him dwelling among us, nothing is left to chance. Think about it in terms of the New Testament. Jesus did not come to us at a random point in history. His arrival was not unannounced. It was not unexpected. Scripture prophesied all of these things. What Jesus did, what He said, what He accomplished, all of it had a purpose. All of it was fulfillment of prophecy. There's no more important work than that of Jesus, so nothing is left to random chaos. This is how he came to us. Likewise, how we should go to him. Right? We should put thought and intention behind how we approach our God. The final two items we're going to be able to talk about tonight are the veil and the screen, starting in verse 31. You shall make a veil woven of blue, purple, and scarlet thread and fine woven linen. It shall be woven with an artistic design of cherubim. You shall hang upon it the four pillars of acacia wood overlaid with gold. Their hooks shall be gold upon four sockets of silver. You shall hang the veil from the clasp, and then you shall bring the ark of the testimony in there behind the veil. The veil shall be a divider for you between the holy place and the most holy. You shall put the mercy seat upon the ark of the testimony in the most holy. You shall set the table outside the veil and the lampstand across from the table on the side of the tabernacle towards the south. You shall put the table on the north side. So next two items are the first of two hanging curtains as opposed to the curtains on the top. These are curtains on the inside, right? The one serving as the divider is this veil that divides between the holy place and the most holy. And it literally is the holy of holies. Uh, kodesh kodeshim, ha-kodeshim, all right? The shim is the plural, but you might hear holy of holies in that, right? The same words used, one's plural. And the most holy place, the Holy of Holies, the Ark of the Testimony with this mercy seat, that's where it is. Nothing else in there. No other decoration. It's that and that alone. 
The other two items of furniture, well, there's one more that we haven't talked about yet, the altar of incense. We'll get to that in a couple weeks. But you've got the lampstand, the table of showbread, and the altar of incense. They're in the outer holy place. Like the first layer of covering for the tabernacle, this one's also decorated with this blue, purple, and scarlet thread also with images of cherubim woven throughout. This veil is hung on these golden hooks on these four pillars of acacia wood overlay with gold. Veil in front looks what? Just like the ceiling overhead. Again, symbolizing this throne room of God. Now, it's not mentioned here, but the veil is what separated the priests from the most holy place with the unveiled glory of God inside, right? Nobody could go into the tabernacle except for the priests, and nobody could go beyond that veil into the most holy place except the most high priest one day a year with a specific sacrifice to be offered there. That's only after he offered a ton of sacrifices for his own sin before he went in. It's so holy, nobody goes in ever except under a very specific circumstance. Now, what happened in the New Testament with the temple equivalent of this veil? Oh, it was torn in two from top to bottom at the death of Jesus, Matthew 27, 51. What happens? Jesus has given us full and free access to God. Through the cross, we go beyond the veil into the Holy of Holies. Verse 36, you shall make a screen for the door of the tabernacle, woven in blue, purple, and scarlet thread, and fine woven linen, woven by a weaver, you shall make for the screen five pillars of acacia wood, overlay them with gold. Their hooks shall be gold. You shall cast five sockets of bronze for them. So that second and hanging curtains, that really serves basically as the entrance to the tabernacle structure itself. It's also made of the same gold or, or blue, purple, scarlet thread. No images of cherubim on this, all right? This also hung on five pillars instead of four. Four was for the internal veil, five for the outside. Um, but again, attached to the golden hooks and all of that. This is the first time, though, we read of this blue, purple, and scarlet thread on the linen not having images of cherubim. Why? Well, it makes sense. This is the outer door to the tabernacle structure. What we find in the tabernacle overall is that you go from profane on the outside to holy, 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 or holy, or holiest on the inside. It's a progression. As the closer you get to God, the holier it gets. And so it's not the cherubim on the outside because you haven't reached the throne room of God yet but then you get to the throne room and that's where the cherubim comes, right? A lot so far. There's a lot more to come. We only scratch the surface of what's there. But we see the basics, right? This is sheer grace that God would choose to dwell among his people. And this is the way he said to do it. He dwelt in this way. He showcases his incomprehensible holiness in beautiful ways. He wanted his people always to know that he's holy, or always to remember his holiness. They're to fear him in their approach. That doesn't change for the church. If anything, it ought to be magnified. How much more of the presence of God do we experience by having Jesus approach humanity and dwell among us? And beyond that, if it's possible to think beyond that, the actual presence of God, the Holy Spirit, has taken up residence within each of us as born-again believers. That is incredible. Christians, we ought to be continually impressed with the holiness of God and the magnitude of grace that is on display that He would choose to dwell among us. But we do it God's way. It's not our way. It's not come to God however we feel like coming. It's coming to God on His terms in His way through Christ Jesus. It's easy to lose sight of the privilege that it is that God would invite us to draw near to him. We don't want to lose sight of that privilege. We want to cherish it. We want to worship God for it. We also want to answer that invitation. And perhaps there's some here that they've never approached God in his way. They wanted to approach God in their way. Well, God's told you how to come. He came near to us through Jesus Christ. Now we need to respond by going through Jesus Christ back to God. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through Him. And if you've never done so before, tonight you can. He's drawn near to you. You now draw near to Him in repentance and faith. And you can do that as we pray. Father, thank you so much for coming among us in Jesus. 
I thank you for choosing to dwell among us and inviting us to dwell with you forever. The thing about dwelling place, Jesus is preparing a home for us now. We'll be with you forever. What an amazing thought that is. Father, I would pray for anyone who's not yet received uh, Jesus as their Savior and Lord. Receive Jesus as the one who has sacrificed for them. Receive Jesus as the one who provides atonement for every single one of their sins. Let this be the moment they do so, looking to Jesus as their bread of life, looking to Jesus as the light of the world, looking to Jesus as the sacrifice made for them. Let them put their faith in Christ and be saved. And for the rest of us, Lord, help us cherish the fact that we have been invited to dwell with you, and Lord, you actually dwell within us through your Holy Spirit right now. Help us be dumbstruck by that fact. We thank you, Lord Jesus, and we pray all these things in your name. Amen.